I say it every Sunday, but we're such a social crowd. I love it. It's good. Well, welcome. My name is Pastor Brandon Robertson. Good morning. Good to see you. And this week, we're kicking off a new three-week series here at Mission Gathering called, What is the Bible? And just to give you a big picture of where we're going, over the next three weeks, today we're going to start with asking the question, what is the Bible? And how did we get it? How do we use it? Why do we use it? Next week, we're going to look at the story of the Old Testament, and then the following week, we'll look at this New Testament story, and then we'll be into the Easter season already, which is a little crazy, but um, so be around here for that. It's going to be an exciting month ahead of us. So let's jump in by asking the most basic question, what is the Bible? Now, I really, really love and sometimes really, really dislike the Bible. Is anybody else in here with me? On one hand, there is no book that has shaped my life more than the Bible, that I've read more than the Bible. I got a degree in the Bible. I've spent years studying the Bible. And yet sometimes when I open up the Bible, it's really, really disturbing. Or it's really, really confusing. Or it just doesn't seem to be applicable to me in my life today. So that's this tension that I live in, and I'm sure that many of us in this room can relate to that. That tension of feeling like the Bible is something really special, that God works through the Bible in our lives in certain ways, but also that sometimes the Bible just seems a little irrelevant. Anybody else with me? Yeah? On one level, I'm sure that many of us believe that we know the answer to kind of the question that we're asking in this series, what is the Bible? But on another level, I think that when we dig into these questions actually at a deep level, I think we'll be surprised what we find when we look into the history of where the Bible came from and what it was meant to be used for. So to start today, I want to give us a working definition of the Bible. So for our purposes, we're going to say this, that the Bible is a library of writings recorded over a period of 4,000 years, written by dozens of authors in various countries, coming from primarily an oral tradition, and it records their history, their myths, their laws, their religious teachings and rituals, particularly of the Hebrew people. The Bible as we know it today, containing the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, was not compiled until the third century. Our particular Protestant edition of the Bible, the one that most of you probably have, didn't come around until a little bit later. It wasn't solidified until the 1500s. And there's also books that aren't in the Protestant Bible that are used by a majority of Christians around the world, including the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, and even the Anglican Church. And those are called the apocryphal writings. So on the surface level, this is what the Bible is. It's this book containing the history, the myths, the traditions of the Hebrew people. And since its very beginning, people have understood the Bible to be divinely sacred, They began to talk about the Bible as being inspired by God. That word literally meaning inspirited, meaning that God's breath speaks through the text in a special way. And following the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, Christians began to develop a theology of scripture that saw it not merely as divine, but the Bible became the word of God. And they were taught that it was dictated by God himself. The scriptures move from being inspired by God to being the infallible and inerrant words of God, meaning that every single word, every jot and tittle from Genesis to Revelation was said to be objectively, completely true for all time and all people. And that means whatever the Bible speaks to, history, science, reason, it's all true objectively. For the Protestants, the Bible became the paper pope, a rigid So-called literal interpretation was declared to be the only way that you could understand the scripture. The words were to be considered true on their face level, and there was no room for any deeper meaning or deeper context. This way of viewing the Bible has been the dominant view in American Christianity and in Protestant and evangelical churches for about 300 years. At the same time, Christians around the world, as I said, who don't identify as Protestant, have maintained a broader understanding of what the Bible is and how the Bible is to be used. This, again, includes the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox, the Anglican, and many mainline Protestant denominations. And of course, for most people, most Jewish people around the world, 
The Bible isn't seen as a a rigid text that's objectively true in everything it says, but a living text that can be reinterpreted for our day and for our age. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing the difference between the traditional Protestant view of Scripture and the broader Christian and Jewish understanding of Scripture is because that most of us here probably grew up with the evangelical understanding of the Bible. But here at Mission Gathering, I want to invite us into a broader conversation about how we use the scripture beyond just taking it literally on its surface and instead saying what is God doing in the scripture beneath the literal words. So, I know that was a crash course, seminary education in the Bible right there, so I'm gonna summarize really quickly what I just said. The Bible is a library of books constructed by humans, largely from an oral tradition, as a means of passing on those stories and rituals and beliefs to future generations. The exact makeup of the books of the Bible differs depending on where you are in the world and what Christian tradition you belong to. Christians have always affirmed that the Bible is inspired by God. The Spirit of God speaks uniquely through the Bible, and almost every Christian tradition would affirm that. And the way we interpret the Bible is also dependent on our tradition, and our cultural context. But the traditional way throughout history of looking at the Bible was rarely literal, and most often free form. So, now because the Bible, now we understand that the Bible was never written as a single book, but is in fact a library of books written by dozens of people over thousands of years, we shouldn't be surprised that the Bible doesn't give us one single narrative or storyline. And in fact, its understandings and conceptions of God change throughout Scripture. Has anyone else noticed that? That when you read the Bible in the Old Testament versus the Bible in the New Testament, there seems to be a significant difference in how people think about God and faith and life. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job, actually. And in that book, we see an image of God that most of us probably don't believe in. The image of God in Job is not even a single God. God is a part of a council of gods. And in the book of Job, God is equal to Satan. And God actually makes a bet with the devil over the life of Job. Most of us probably don't believe in that God, am I right? A God who puts bets on people's lives just for the fun of it. Then in Genesis, which is the next book to be written, we see a pluralistic image of God still continuing. In Genesis chapter 1, the word used for God in Hebrew is Elohim. And that word literally is plural. It means multiple gods. And then we see by the time Abraham emerges in Genesis chapter 12, we begin to see the develop of monotheism. And Abraham talks about this God called Yahweh, a God who becomes the more consistent character throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible. However, what we see in the God of Yahweh is that Yahweh is a God of war and wrath, a God who desires to see people conform and has a chosen group of people and separates them from the rest of the world. And then by the time we get to Jesus in the New Testament, we see a dynamic shift away away from the way that the Hebrew tradition has understood God. Jesus intentionally amends the scripture. He quotes from the Hebrew Bible and leaves out verses that talk about this God of war or wrath or a God who thirsts for blood and instead preaches a God of justice and grace and love. And after Jesus, we see throughout the rest of the New Testament this wrestling between the early Christians who were all Jewish and Jesus' understanding of God, and we see them wrestling back and forth. Do we take the Hebrew Bible as we've understood it for thousands of years, or do we do this new thing that Jesus has done? Do we interpret it through the lens of Jesus? Again, the Bible isn't a single book, but a library of books written by different people at different times, And when you understand that, this makes perfect sense. None of the authors of the Bible thought that they were going to have all of their books compiled into a single book, so they weren't trying to be consistent with their storyline. You would expect that different continents and different perspectives and different worldviews would be reflected in the text. But the other interesting and important aspect that the Bible gives us is that it also shows how humans in general have shifted in our understanding of the world over a long period of time how we've progressed as a species, morally, spiritually, and even physically. In our oldest scriptures, we see our ancestors understanding God in the world as a deity 
who wasn't necessarily good or kind, one that needed to be appeased through sacrifice and ritual. They cried out to God so that rain would come because they believed God controlled all of the weather. And they called on God to defeat warring tribes. Then we see an evolution in the Hebrew Bible towards an organized religious system where Moses develops the Ten Commandments. And we see Judaism begin to emerge as a distinct religious system with standards and practices. Nevertheless, we have ample scriptures that show us that the Hebrew Bible and the Hebrew people in the Hebrew Bible put words in the mouth of God to justify their own conquest and the violence they did to others. After all, it can't be wrong if God said to do it, right? Then the temple emerges, and we see another shift, away from this literal religion of laws to a more figurative way of speaking and living. Judaism becomes a more official, organized religion and becomes intertwined with politics and culture. And again, in Jesus, we see yet again that revolutionary turn from a system of rules and rituals to a religion that calls you simply to love your, en love your enemies and your neighbors as yourself. In the later New Testament, the scriptures continue to evolve, continue to emerge, and we even see that they move beyond the Jewish people to the Gentiles, which was just a word that meant everyone else. And so in Jesus, we see this book that was meant for one group of people, one tribe of people, one race of people, going to the rest of the world and the message of grace and truth expanding. Do we see this arc and this trajectory? We go from a garden to a city. We go from one person, Adam, to a family of people, Abraham, to a race of people, the Jewish people, to the whole world. And in the beginning of the Bible, we see this darkness and the light emerges by the book of Revelation, so much so that there is no need for a sun anymore, as the book of Revelation says, because this light expands and encompasses all of creation. Because the Bible was compiled over such a huge swath of time, it provides us with a unique glimpse and understanding of how humans once thought, and also shows us where some of our most basic impulses and desires come from. See, in this way, the Bible is like no other book. It is truly holy and sacred and set apart. There is no other book that has compiled so much wisdom and history and tragedy and stories and teachings. There is no other book that has been used by billions of people over thousands of years. I like to say that I see the Bible as my spiritual family's photo album. When I open it, I see where we've been. I reflect on where we're going. And I use that wisdom and that tradition and those teachings and their perspectives to inform my life today. But also, I acknowledge that there's a more mysterious and mystical reality about the Bible. That for some reason, the Spirit of God has faithfully spoken through this book to billions of people for thousands of years. The Bible, in this sense, is a channel through which God speaks. God uniquely has used this to shape governments and shape events of the world and shape the spiritual lives of many of us in this room. And that reality and tension must be acknowledged and held as well. Now one question that you might be wondering is why I haven't referred to the Bible as the Word of God. Has it come up on the screen here? Let's put up the next slide. This is scary for some of us. But the Bible is not the word of God. Now, before you throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> let me explain what I mean. Let's be provocative this morning. You know, I got to keep you on your toes. In the Bible, the phrase word of God never refers to the Bible itself. First, because the Bible didn't exist when the Bible was being written. So the Bible can't talk about itself. That's impossible. But also, no, none of the writers of the Bible knew that the Bible would ever be compiled. In this sense, as I said, it's absolutely impossible for the writers of scripture when they say the word of God to be talking about the book that they didn't know would exist. So if the phrase word of God doesn't refer to the Bible, what does it refer to? Let's look at two passages where this phrase is used most often. And the first one comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Hebrew, Hebrews. And in this passage he writes, the word of God is living and active sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. If you grew up in church, you most likely were taught that this verse was talking about the Bible. 
And if you grew up in the kind of church I did, we had this cheesy thing called sword drills based on this because it says the Bible sharper than a two-edged sword and the youth group would hold up their... It's just a terrible thing. Be grateful you didn't have to go through it if you didn't. So, let's be biblical literalists for a second and examine what this verse actually says on its surface. First, it says that the word of God is living and active. In the early church, there was one central claim that all Christians gathered around, and that claim was this, that Jesus is alive. The early church believed that Christ was risen, living in them and through them in the world. And that was the central claim that Paul says, if you don't believe that, our faith is completely meaningless. They believed in a resurrected, living and active savior. At this point in history, when these words are being written, remember that the New Testament doesn't yet exist. The early Christians are being expelled from synagogues and the broader Jewish community because they're seen as unorthodox, proclaiming that this guy named Jesus rose from the dead. And then Jesus himself directly amends and contradicts and changes the words of the Hebrew Bible. And Paul spends so, so much time writing and spilling so much ink telling the early church that they are not bound by the Hebrew Bible, but rather this new law of grace. So from this context alone, we can safely assume that whatever Paul is talking about here isn't the Hebrew Bible. That was the only Bible that existed, and that's not what Paul's talking about. The Hebrew Bible, first and foremost, isn't living and active. I think we can all look at this book and assume it's not alive. That's a strange statement to make about a book. Second, the early Christians' primary faith claim was that Jesus is alive and active. So from logical deduction, we can assume that when Paul's writing here, he's actually speaking about Jesus and not the Bible. And luckily for us, there's more evidence that proves this. In the introduction to the Gospel of John, the writer of John opens with these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then 14 verses later, he says, And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the Son of God. So at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, the writer is actually paralleling Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. He's beginning with a new creation story. And he says, at the very beginning was this thing called the word. Now, quick trivia question. Was the Bible in existence at the beginning of creation? No. In fact, Paul, or the writer of John says, whatever this thing called the word is, it was with God in the beginning, and it was God. Again, the Bible is not God. <clears throat> then we're told 14 verses later that this thing called the word becomes flesh in the person of Jesus and makes his dwelling among us. So clearly, from the book of John and from the writing in Hebrews, when the Bible speaks of the word of God, it is speaking of the living and active Christ that is risen from the dead and is the hope of all Christians and has been the hope of all Christians for 2,000 years. Instead of allegiance to a book, we are called to allegiance to a living and active Christ that continues to work, continues to speak, continues to transform our world into the kingdom of God. And do you know what happens when we pledge our allegiance to a book instead of the living and active word of God? We begin, when we begin to say that the Bible is the central authority and every word is absolutely true, we do what our ancestors did. We use their examples. We use their stories to justify war and oppression and to make God the great justifier of our actions. We begin to believe yet again that we are the chosen people the Bible is speaking about, just like they did in the stories of old. And that God has given us a mandate to conquer nations and tribes and lands and promote our version of righteousness. See, when a book like the Bible, understood as the word of God and divine, gets in the hands of the powerful, who are able to divorce its words from its context and interpret them based on their singular worldview or perspective, the Bible becomes a tool for manipulation instead of liberation. We move backwards on our trajectory of human evolution instead of forwards. 
Instead of following the Spirit of God, whom Jesus promised would continue to lead us into all the truth, we are bound by the chains of that which was once written. This isn't how Jesus used the Bible. It's not how the Jewish people have consistently used the Bible for 4,000 years. And so I want to suggest it shouldn't be the way that Christians in the 21st century use the Bible either. At Mission Gathering, let it be known that we are all about Jesus. And yes, what we know about Jesus comes from the Bible. But we take the words of Jesus literally and believe, in fact, that he is living and active. And we seek to be faithful to his spirit wherever it leads. Which means that sometimes we might be called into contradiction with some of those things that are written in the Bible. We will often be called to move beyond the static words of Scripture to see the principle behind them. But when we do this, we do it only through the lens and in faithfulness to the living and active Word of God, Christ Himself. Amen? Amen? Amen. So the big question that remains for us this morning is, how then should we use the Bible? I want to give us three quick ways as you engage with the scripture, and I hope you will engage with the scripture, that we can use the biblical text to enrich our community and our individual spiritual lives. First, we should always read the Bible through the lens of Jesus. When I say this, I mean that we should always begin with the words of Jesus written in the four Gospels. For Christians, the Gospels in its original sense, and we'll talk about this more in two weeks, were supposed to be our new Torah. They were supposed to be the place where all of our ethics and spiritual principles and lessons come from. And the Gospels are a fairly reliable account of what Jesus actually taught and what Jesus actually did. And so as we engage through the rest of the Bible, we should put the Gospel on as our first lens and read everything else through it. If anything else in Scripture contradicts what Jesus says, Jesus gets the final word. So when we read about the God of the Old Testament calling for mass execution we need to look through Jesus' lens of how he saw the Bible. He says to love our enemies, and he did the same with his. Therefore, we take Jesus' standard as our standard and use that to understand and begin to examine how our ancestors misinterpreted God and misused God and misused their power to oppress and do evil. So when we look at the Bible through the lens of Jesus, I believe we'll see a much more liberating use of the Bible to begin with. Second, we should read the Bible as a channel through which God still speaks. Again, I'm not going to sit up here and give you some comprehensive theology of how and why God speaks through the Bible. But all I can say is that billions of people would testify that the Spirit of God has spoken to them through the text in some unique way. Many of us in this room would say that the Spirit of God speaks to us through the text. So I want to encourage you to pick up the Bible Find a portion of it that resonates with you. And then pray, ask God, speak a word to me for my day, for right now, for my circumstances. And oftentimes, God will use this ancient text to speak directly to our lives. Sometimes it'll be words of comfort or rebuke, sometimes words of direction. And this doesn't have to be your only or even primary spiritual practice, by the way. Depending on what tradition you grew up in, like mine, the Bible, reading the Bible was pretty much the only thing that you had to do to be right with God. And if you didn't do it every day, you were going to hell or something like that. This doesn't have to be your primary spiritual practice, but it is a practice that Christians have faithfully engaged in for thousands of years. And I want to invite you into this family of Christianity to follow in this faithful practice that has proven to be reliable for so many people. And lastly, I want to invite you to engage the Bible and learn from the timeless wisdom of our ancestors. At the end of this message, I want to reiterate that while humans have evolved far beyond many of the ways that ancient people saw the world, we are by no means superior to them. The wisdom that the characters of the Bible had, the stories they told, they often mirror our own. So when we look at the Bible, I invite us to do it as a conversation with our forerunners in faith not taking their words and actions as absolutely true or things that we need to emulate, but rather listening for the wisdom and the lessons that they can teach us for our lives in our world today. These are three practical ways in which we can engage with the Bible. And I officially give you permission to experiment. <laughs>
get pissed off, disagree with the text, but engage because it's a sacred and beautiful and divinely inspired text. And I promise you that if you spend time with the scripture, you will be better for it. Amen? Thank you.